Should academic research be available to everyone? How should such a flow of information be regulated? Why would the accessibility of information ever be so controversial? This is Caitlin Phillips with the Oxford Comment. Our topic today is open access, also known as OA, the movement established and defined in the early 2000s to ensure the free access to and reuse of academic research on the internet. In 2004, Oxford University Press became the first publisher to transition a mature journal to open access. And OUP has been a leading publisher of open access journals ever since. Our two interviews today cover the basics of open access, OUP's drive to disseminate academic research as widely as possible, and how easily accessible research has impacted various academic fields around the world. This last fact is especially important as the world continues to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic. Our first guest is Rhiannon Meaden, a senior publisher for journals at OUP. Welcome everyone to the Oxford Comment. I'm Caitlin Phillips. We're here today with Rhiannon. Rhiannon, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, um, thanks for having me. I'm Rhiannon Meaden. I'm a senior publisher in our journals team and I work specifically on our open access program. Okay, so define for us open access. What is open access? Well, um, there are many different forms of open access. So there's a few different definitions, but broadly what we're talking about here is making research publications available um, and whether that's journal articles or book chapters, um, making them freely available to read and also to reuse. So for journals which are fully gold open access or for some of our hybrid titles um, which offer open access options, this can mean publishing articles under a Creative Commons license and there are several different types of those. So reuse is generally permitted depending on the type and on the license issues and attribution is usually required. So that means that authors get credit for their published work. There's also green open access and that can come in various different forms, but generally that means that at least kind of a version of the paper can be made available. For example, that can include in a preprint server or maybe in an institutional repository. And sometimes that's after a set embargo period, say maybe three or six months. So what are some of the benefits you know, for researchers in the world of research to having all of this access? Well, one of the key benefits of publishing open access is that research can have a much wider and more diverse dissemination larger groups of stakeholders within the research community can access open access research and that can include policy makers, independent researchers or researchers who are at smaller institutions and have fewer journal subscriptions. It can also include practitioners in a range of fields and of course also the general public. So they've often funded the research in the first place. Open access can be particularly important also for researchers in developing countries where library budgets tend to be more limited and access to research can be challenging when published behind a paywall. Another major benefit of open access is that it enables the reuse of research, which allows others to build on the published research much more easily. So what is it that Oxford University Press uh, does to support the growth of open access? Well, OUP's mission is to create world-class academic and educational resources and make them available as widely as possible. So in many facets of our publishing program, open access can really help us to achieve this through the increased dissemination of our published articles. OUP was right at the forefront of open access journals publishing many years ago. We were one of the first publishers to flip a major subscription journal to fully OA right back in 2005 when we flipped nucleic acids research to open access. And since then, we've been developing a diverse program of high quality, fully open access journals. More recently, we have launched the first couple of journals in a new flagship open access series, which we're calling our Oxford Open series. These journals are all community focused and aim to provide really high quality and impactful fully open access venues for research in a quite wide range of different disciplines. So just to give you a kind of flavour of that, this year the series was launched with Oxford Open Immunology and Oxford Open Material Science, so two very different disciplines. And our next title set to launch in early 2021 will be Oxford Open Climate Change, which is now accepting submissions. So on top of that, we also facilitate 
open access publication in our hybrid journals and in many cases we're working really closely with our society partners to support them to ensure that their journals continue to serve the research communities that they really represent. We also work with those society partners to help them to develop new open access journals or to transition their existing portfolios to fully open access models. But it's worth saying that every discipline and every society is slightly different and they're all at different stages when it comes to open access. So we treat all of these decisions on a very individual basis. Another thing that we've been working on in terms of our kind of open access support is our read and publish agreements. And these have proven to be quite popular. Under these new agreements, institutions enter into an arrangement with OUP which enables their researchers both to read our subscription content but also to publish their own articles open access in our journals and these agreements are really helping to smooth that transition towards open access. Beyond our kind of publishing and sales models we also often collaborate with several stakeholders around the world such as publishers, funders, institutions and librarians, as well as, of course, our society partners, to help to lead the conversation as the industry really kind of moves towards this transition to open access. So what does the future of all of this open you know, access to research look like? Yeah, that, that's a big question. So open research more broadly is, is really rapidly evolving, and that makes this kind of a tricky question to answer. Open access continues to accelerate, so we don't necessarily see that slowing down anytime soon, and, and we can see that this will continue to grow. But alongside that, there are a number of other really important developments within open research, and they're at various different stages of maturation. One example is there has been a huge movement towards open data in the last few years, and um, OUP has recently implemented our own data policies across a large number of our um, journals portfolio. And open data will continue to be an important part of the open research ecosystem. Research, in addition to that, is, is under greater scrutiny than ever before. And there are various open research movements to try and improve research reproducibility. So um, being able to ensure that the um, findings that we've published can be reproduced so we know that they're, they're valid. So um, some of the kind of items that are being looked at in, in that field are open methodologies, registered reports and protocol publication, among others. There's also a move towards increased transparency, which kind of goes alongside our kind of open research ecosystem. And in particular, um, transparency within the peer review and the publishing process, which has traditionally been somewhat more of a black box. OUP already offers various different forms of open and transparent peer review on a number of our journals. And then kind of counterbalancing that, there are also arguments around eliminating or reducing bias in the publication process and achieving that by kind of building an additional blinding to workflows. So for example, double and triple blind peer review. And we do offer double blind on a number of our journals, but I kind of ventured out of the realms of open research there. Um, so, so I should probably leave that there. So talk us through, so what are some of the challenges uh, that come with open access? And then what are some of the opportunities that come with open access? So with all rapidly evolving initiatives, there are challenges with implementation and we're really keen to engage with open research initiatives where relevant. For example, we've just joined the initiative for open abstracts. We continue to push for increasing openness in the research process and so we want to ensure that we have really robust processes and policies and workflows in place to manage these changing behaviours that we're seeing in the research community. Sometimes that speed of change can pose a challenge in this regard, and, and that goes both for these kind of newer open research initiatives and with open access, which, although it's very well established, does continue to evolve and change, and uh, in that respect throws up new challenges, which we are kind of constantly needing to make changes and adjust to. But for me, this speed of change that we have is one of the most interesting and exciting things about working in open access publishing. One of the themes, actually, of this year's OA Week 
was around building structural equity and inclusion. And I think that still remains one of the biggest challenges for the publishing community. We need to think about how do we ensure that we aren't simply moving from one more traditional publishing model which favours wealthy countries and institutions and therefore reinforces structural racism, gender equality and other forms of discrimination to another model which does exactly the same thing. We have an opportunity now to ensure that we consider the wider research community as we build these open access publishing programmes. We want them to be inclusive and fair and equitable for all of our stakeholders. And there's a couple of examples of things that OUP is doing towards that goal, and that includes offering waivers on fees for authors in our Developing Countries programme across all of our fully open access titles. We've also recently joined the Research for Life Open Access Task Force to further explore areas where we can provide support. We're also committed to pursuing fair and sustainable read and publish agreements across the world. And we're really aiming to publish diverse content, which includes a range of contributions from outside of the more traditional publishing centres. It's definitely very interesting. What are some of the changes you've seen to open access over the years? Sure. So, yeah, it's been a massively changing environment working in open access publishing over the last about 10 years that I've been working in this field. And we've gone really from from 10 years ago, people not really always understanding what open access was. You know, I would go to conferences as an open access publisher and people would still be kind of asking me, well, well, we don't understand what is open access, how does it work, why is it important? And there's been a real shift change to now there is this really good understanding in, in almost all fields. And, and not, I'm not saying that that understanding wasn't there in many fields 10 years ago, but it certainly wasn't as consistent as it is now. And we now have that really good understanding of what open access is and what the benefits are, but also we have a much more robust system to help make it more accessible for people. So one of the big barriers to publishing open access is charging article processing charges. And for authors, that sometimes can be, I guess, you know, it's at at least an an additional admin burden. But in, in some cases, it can actually be very challenging to access the funding to pay those article processing charges. And we've gone from a system where that used to often come out of researchers' individual pockets. And now we have much more robust systems and processes in place that that can be handled centrally in in many, many cases, um, either by funders or by institutions. And that really just helps to kind of push this forward more. And the other big shift change that we've seen in the last 10 years or so is that this has really evolved from a conversation about how do we make research more accessible and how do we make research available to read to now actually we're getting more into a system which is about how do we build on that so okay we can read and and access this huge body of research how can we make it useful and that's where initiatives such as open data have been really you know pushing this forward is that this this research is is helpful to have it open access. It's helpful for everybody to read it. Um, but really, what we want to do now is is have this research, which is also going to be able to be reused in in the best and the and the most valid way. So we've really evolved right through from kind of just making the article available to what more can we do to help the open research field more broadly. So it's no longer just a question of open access but now a much broader question of open research overall. Right, that's interesting, sort of stepping from just having it there, but to how to actually use it. What does it mean? Exactly. How do we make that research helpful? Right, right. So there are some detractors to open access who, do, who don't feel like it is, you know, all, all the, I don't know, who, who don't really feel like it, it is as helpful or is as necessary as some people feel. What are some of those arguments? And, and have you maybe seen some quieting down of that as open access has transformed and as open access has changed? So I, I should start by answering this by just saying that I, I will probably give a biased answer because I am an open access publisher and, and that is also my background. So I'm a, I'm a kind of big advocate for open access. But but what I would say is that there are certainly valid arguments as to why open access isn't going to be 
right for all journals and not necessarily right for all authors. It's certainly a choice. And what I like about the system that we have in place at the moment is that authors can choose how they want to publish. And there are so many options available to them now that, you know, if they want to publish open access, then there are plenty of good quality open access venues in in most disciplines and there are equally good subscription titles where they can publish without needing to kind of go through that barrier of finding funds for the article processing charge. So, So that's one of the kind of key things I think is that it's good for us to have options. So I think that when there was a misunderstanding about what open access is, right, you sort of mentioned that right. people weren't really uh, understanding or aware of how it functioned and, and what kinds of benefits it could support. Are some of those detractors perhaps uh, coming around or are you seeing, you know, a more open and, and, and acceptance of open access because you know, like you're saying, they've sort of recognized it's not an all or nothing proposition. It's not everything needs to be open, everything needs to be this way or that way, but that having those opportunities for certain spaces, you know, certain articles, certain authors uh, to be able to do that um, is important and has led to, you know, some really meaningful research being accessed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly. And and I think one of the kind of key things for us as a society publisher is that For many of our societies, moving to a system which is fully open access is just not necessarily viable for them. It may, um, for example, prevent them to to continue with other activities that are subsidised or funded by the subscription fees that they charge for their journals. And, And in many cases, those are really important activities that they're funding. So... For for some journals, open access won't be the the full answer. On most of those journals, we are able to work with a system that now can enable open access publications for those authors who want that. Want that. Um, while we keep alongside that, we keep um, subscription content as well. So we do recognise that it doesn't necessarily provide a one, you know, one, one size fits all answer. But I think there have certainly been kind of big shifts over the last few years, and there seem to be fewer barriers now, at least you know, for authors directly, much fewer barriers towards making their research more easily available. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like open access has given you know choice and has given some options that work for some and don't work for others. But for the ones that it does work for, it seems a benefit in in a lot of ways. Yes, uh, so just so many benefits. I think for, from the author's side, there are so many benefits. It's really about ensuring that we have the right structures in place that we can enable open access publishing for as many authors as possible so that they can take advantage of those benefits. Well, thank you, Rhiannon, for being so open about open access with us. You know, it's really interesting to see how OUP's mission, you know, to really create a robust and interesting and, you know, connected research, you know, works with open access. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Our second guest is Professor Daniel Altman of the Department of Immunology and Inflammation at Imperial College London. He's the editor-in-chief of Oxford Open Immunology. Welcome to the Oxford Comment. We're here today with Danny Altman. Uh, Danny, could you please introduce yourself for us? Yes, I'm, I'm Danny. I'm Professor of Immunology at Imperial College London. And I've been um, an editor at various immunology and vaccinology journals for over 20 years. And at the moment, I'm very excited for the first time in in my career to be editor at a fully open access journal, which is um, Oxford Open Immunology. Excellent. And so what does open access sort of allow for you as a researcher? What does it mean to you as a researcher? Well, I think, you know, for all of us as as researchers, it's a really big topic at the moment, which looms very large, doesn't it? So, you know, what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, we're we're living in a time of of, of rapid change. So I grew up in in medical research at a time when um, publishing was something that you understood through going down to the medical school library and it had dark wooden shelves and it had leather bound volumes. And all the key journals where you wanted to publish your work and read your work were the ones where there were hundreds of years of bound volumes going back through medical history. And those were the ones that you had to, where you had to be seen. 
And, you know, if you fast forward to 2021, we're being dragged kicking and screaming into a very different world, aren't we? Where we know and we appreciate that we're we're really, you know, morally duty bound, you know, for the good of our science as much as anything else, to publish our work through open access in a way that our colleagues all over the world can read it and cite it and work with it and interact with us, whether or not they have hundreds of years of, of leather-bound volumes in, in their medical school libraries. And so somehow we've got to kind of bridge that divide and yeah. inhabit that new world. And, um, you know, I'm really excited that it's finally happening. So you sort of talked about ways that it's really opened up research for people across the globe. Are, are there challenges, though, to publishing within open access? There are there are enormous challenges. You know, first of all, you know, the thing that I've just alluded to, that kind of period of transition where we know that we're in a new world and speaking a new language and communicating with people in, you know, in an infinitely preferable, more equitable way. And we really do sign up to that. And yet, like any period of transition, there are parts that are painful. So sometimes our elders won't appreciate that we're living in this in this new age. And we'll say, well, you know, this isn't the crusty old journal that I used to publish in. This is a new journal. Do we approve of new journals? So, you know, there's a period of transition to, to get the new journals and the whole new publishing structure on the map and recognized and appreciated. And I think I think there are there are genuine efforts to try and do that. And then of course you need to think how you're going to pay things, you know, your article page charges and things. It's a whole new structure to how we do research and fund medical publishing in research. So we need um we need our funders and our universities and our employers to be on board to understand that this is part of a of a new, much better way of doing things and to make sure that the cash is in the bank to make sure that we can we can do this stuff so specifically for this you know year plus now we're heading into um, with COVID-19 how has open access really affected how research has been done on that yeah I, I, I think I think open access has has played a very big part and you know I know it's it's almost perverse to talk about you know anybody having a good COVID in inverted commas because there's no such thing but it has played to the strengths of some rather than others. And so if you're a journal that's online and nimble and fleet of foot and instantly and openly accessible, that, you know, that's exactly the kind of publication format that you need in the time of COVID. And I'd argue that open access and online journals have, have punched massively above their weight in terms of, like I said, just having that kind of you know, that kind of nimble ability to get stuff out in real time, really fast when people really need it. And more than that, you know, we're, you know, we're not in the 19th century. We want to be able to iterate and discuss things in real time. And how better to do that than in the kind of format that um, an open access journal allows you? Just a follow up to that. Do you think that there is something sort of specifically within medical journals, you know, as opposed to, you know, some other spaces that, that really benefit from open access? Is there something, obviously, medical research is something that everyone is affected by. And so do you think there is some importance, especially to the medical field, to have these open access journals? Yeah, no, completely and utterly. You know, so I'm, I'm not trying to kind of, you know, get one over people in, you know, archaeology or poetry journals or any other journals where I'm sure they also need, you know, widely available, immediately accessible data. But how much more so if you look back on the last year, of COVID-19 that, you know, medical publishing has changed beyond all recognition in terms of our requirements and our expectations. And to some extent, that's to do with a kind of interface with our expectations from social media platforms and the idea that we've got this, you know, insatiable, impatient appetite to see data more rapidly, to argue about it in real time, to iterate in, in, in real time. And open access publishing has played a very big part in that. Because, you know, if somebody else on the other side of the world has got a sequence come off their sequencer on Monday, I really want to be able to read about it on Friday, you know, at the latest. And, you know, the old traditional old school journals are really not as, you know, not as well suited to doing that. So you said that you've been, uh, you know, an editor of different uh, journals over the years. How have you seen open access changing over the last maybe 10 to 15 years? You know, how, where did it sort of begin and, and how do you see where it is now? 
oh, well, you know, I've been doing this so long, you know, I really can remember the face of publishing in, in, in the last century, which would be unrecognisable to a PhD student or a postdoc starting now in the same way as a record player or a fountain pen might be unrecognisable to them. Because in the old days, as I said, you published in your hard copy paper journal that got sent to people through their letterboxes. And very often it was a, a rather exclusive sort of society journal. And because of that, it had rather exclusive distribution, largely through the established libraries across the world that paid their subscriptions to, to, to buy those, the, those hard copies. So what did that mean? That meant that you had an enormous post bag every week of these um, little reprint request cards that came to you from all corners of the globe that showed you the hundreds and thousands of researchers who were actually um, excluded from your knowledge base and you know, could get no benefit from the work you'd done until maybe six months or nine months or 12 months later when your paper copy reprints arrived in a bundle through the post and you were able to laboriously stick postage stamps on them and post them out to these different parts of the earth. So, you know, that I guess to most people would sound like ancient history, but that, you know, that was my life and many other people's lives. And, you know, so think, you know, how different to be in a time in, in 2021 when I can do the work, you know, publish it a few weeks later, get it up online a few a few weeks after that and have, you know, a researcher from, you know, from any continent, irrespective of, you know, how rich or poor their medical school library is, um, contact me and say, I was really interested in your PCR primers. Can you tell me the sequences or whatever? You know, that's a joy. That's why we do science. Yeah, I mean, that it, that sounds like a, you know, a span of 500 years of difference, right? Exactly. You know, to, to sort of go from, I mean, waiting, like you're saying, you know, possibly a year <laughs> uh, to access this information and then now going perhaps, I mean, you even said, you know, Monday to Friday and suddenly it's up on the internet on Friday is just an incredible leap of, uh, you know, transformation for research. So I think I can uh, make some guesses, but you, you've sort of chosen to edit an open access journal, you know, give me some reasons for, for choosing open access, you know, as, as sort of your, your editorial role. Yeah, no, you know, for all, all of the above, really, you know, it felt very, very important to me. So, you know, from the old world I was, I was describing before in your sort of crusty leather bound journals, it was exclusive and excluding. And, you know, if you weren't in that very elite group with the, the, the libraries, with the enormous budgets to access this stuff, the research may as well not, not have happened because you had no way of accessing it and you had no way of sharing in it. And therefore you had no way of contributing to, to, the, to the next round of research. And, you know, I just feel very passionately that we're all in this together and you know, the world, you know, for better and for worse, as we've seen this year, has become a, a very, very small place. And we all need to be able to, to feed off each other's research and cross fertilize each other's research in the most equitable and accessible and level playing field way. And for me, you know, that's what open access is. It's, it's you know, I wouldn't dream of doing it any other way. So. Uh, let me ask you about the future a bit, right? What, what would you like to see open access research, um, you know, doing in the future? Yeah, well, you know, a few, a few answers to that. I mean, you know, the, the first is, you know, what, what I alluded to before, that I think, you know, we're still in a state of transition where perhaps some of our, our sort of stuffier colleagues still haven't really kind of quite got their heads around the idea of open access and why we so desperately need it. And, you know, why many funders actually penalize contributions that aren't open access because, you know, you're not you're not playing the game. You're not you're not sharing your research. So I think there's a bit of a way to go on that. There's been enormous progress. And then, you know, once you've gone down that road of a whole new publishing model and a whole new business model to, to this much more kind of, um, you know, you turned it on its head onto this much more kind of nimble, iterative, reactive platform. Um, you know, the, the sky's the limit. You know, some things we're doing at, at the journal, we're trying to get a much closer alignment to a kind of world that lots of our young postdocs and PhD students have grown up in, where if you have a technical problem and don't know how to solve it, you don't give up or send somebody a letter. You instantly, impatiently go into a chat room and try and find, find somebody who knows more about it than you do. And by the end of the evening, you've got your answer. So, so I think through this whole new model of publishing, which is you know, open access and equitable and accessible and global, you can do that on a grand, grand scale. 
you know, we can make our platforms much more chatty and, you know, just get to our answers much more inclusively, accessibly and rapidly. I think that's an interesting way of putting it sort of chatty that sort of feels intimate, right? Like that that people are beginning to get to know one another and know so-and-so is an expert in this maybe one part of this field that I really need and can go to that person, you know, and, and get help um, or know that this journal, you know, has access to things that I'm regularly researching and need and know that I can go and get that information that I need. Um, it's sort of breaking down the barriers of, of academia feeling you know, stuffy, and that this research and all of that, it, it, you know, can also benefit from maybe people actually knowing one another or or having access to each other. You know, I think that's a very interesting, chatty, I think it's a very interesting framing coming out of academia. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, to, to me, you know, I know that's not the kind of central focus of, of open access, but I, th- I think it is a, a sort of byproduct of open access. And to me, you know, I just adore that. Um, so, you know, in our lab for at least 30 years, we've done a journals club every single Friday, come what may. And there's never a Friday that goes by where somebody isn't saying, you know, why on earth did they, did they do it like that? I don't really understand what they were thinking of there. You know, what was the rationale for doing that? And, you know, in 2021, you know, within 30 seconds, you can have sort of gone onto the website, gone to the Open Access Journal and got in touch with them and, you know, posed that question to them. And you can get answers in real time. And they might even think that you had a bright idea and revise aspects of, of their paper. You know, lots of open access journals have the ability to have that kind of iterative updated in, in real time quality. And, you know, that to me is just you know, a total joy. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, much has been made about the Internet sort of being, you know, this incredible tool and having access to, you know, all of the knowledge of, of time. But how you use it is really the the key. And I think open access sort of seems the the best use of everyone's time, right? Is that to share in these ideas and to move research forward really requires chattiness, requires everybody to talk to each other. And like you're saying, question. And, and perhaps that question brings to a, a different level of understanding. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, absolutely. All of that, you know, so... You know, I don't I don't have any um, data at my fingertips by um, how much of the world of academia you exclude if you have an absolutely non open access policy and only choose to publish in um, you know purely subscription based journals or, or ones that don't put their data on open access for a long period of time. But, you know, why on earth would I want to do my work and exclude, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the global academic community from reading it and accessing it immediately? You know, what on earth would make me do that? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think you're sort of explaining it perfectly of, of, you know, what is your end goal with research, right? You know, isn't it to move ideas forward? Isn't it to move the world forward or to move in the world of, of medicine to move research on cures and things like that forward? Why would we want to hide them behind things? Um, certainly makes sense. To, to steal an expression from my daughter, you know, open access, the clue is in the name, you know, open access. Right. Why on earth would anybody on the planet who's doing research not want open access to their results and not want them shared as widely as possible? You know, we're quite egotistical people. You have to be <laughs> to be a, an academic. Why sure. on earth would you not want to share your data? Right. And and what benefit there is to sharing it, you know, even for yourself, you know, said so you said if someone questions you, perhaps you change your ideas or, or you get a new idea from it. You know, what benefits we get from sharing with one another. Yeah, and ex- exactly that. You know, I, I've many years been sort of boring my friends, telling them <laughs> what an amazingly privileged job I have and how, you know, what a joy it is to be allowed to do the stuff that I do compared to, well, you know, <laughs> compared to lots of the jobs that they do, basically, which is probably why it doesn't go down well. But, um, you know, but it is, a, you know, the, the fact that I can do something and I can come up with an idea and do an experiment and report an experiment and then, you know, make a friend on a different continent who shares some of those ideas and has some parallel ideas or some ideas that follow on from that. You know, that's that's the, really the meaning of open access at its best. That is a joy. Well, I just really appreciate uh, your time, Danny. This has been a really wonderful conversation. I, I truly appreciate it. Great pleasure. We want to thank our featured guests, Rhiannon Meaden, Senior Publisher for Journals at OUP, and Danny Altman, Editor-in-Chief of Oxford Open Immunology. As always, we would like to thank the crew of the Oxford Comment for their continued assistance on each episode. Be sure to follow OUP Academic on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to the Oxford Comment on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. I'm Caitlin Phillips. Thank you for listening.